make it to yesterday's radio play panel? Guess who just wrote a whole new script overnight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As the writer of our little brigade, sometimes I get inspired and, you know, just wrote a, I don't, about a half an hour long radio play I got a, in seven hours. I got a script hours, so. sent to me at three in the morning and I was like, this is good. I gotta stop reading this at three in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Sean is sleeping next to me. I should not be reading something and giggling on my phone at three in the morning, especially a new script that we're gonna rock. Yeah. Uh, I will, I will definitely say, if you're a creative type, the ability to not need sleep is very handy. I don't, I don't yeah. understand. Actually, I do, because I used to only sleep three hours a night, but I kind of kicked the habit. <laughs> okay, hi everyone, welcome Ooh. to How to Get Into Voice Acting. I want to know how many people here are have, have never tried any voice acting at all. Okay. How many people have tried a little bit, dip your toe in, kind of like, I'm not really sure? Good, cool. How many people have already started taking classes? Okay, good mix of people. Good mix of people. Awesome, okay. I think you all know us, but I'm obligated to give an introduction. It is true, it is true. Do, do you actually want me to call up the, the, the script you wrote me, or? It's 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 in here somewhere. I swear. Oh, jeez. Um, Always so melodramatic. I just well, you know, it's um, it's your fault, really, because you wrote all of this, and you're gonna make me say it. So Mike Anthony is a voice actor. He's been an actor since he was five, uh, which includes eight years of voice acting experience. He is the voice of um, Kalimo in the Ballad Singer. Uh, he's Drake in Dragon Master Saga, and eleven different other characters during the radio drama series, Dark Side Drive, which we got to explore a little bit yesterday. Uh, in addition, you are also Silent Killer Gareth in the live action film Yard Sale, which <coughs> netted him an award from the Independent Horror Movie Awards for Best Kill. In the future, Mike will also be showing up in the brand new animated movie, Undergrads, uh, where he's not only an associate producer, he will also be seeing him as himself. Uh, and then lastly, along with just me and, and, and several other people, but just me as in it, it's just Nancy, and then there's also, you know, Justin and several other people who are involved. We'll be doing uh, our first video game together. It is a visual novel called Love and War Amongst the Stars. Which, as the sole writer and having finished the first act, I can tell you it's 40,000 words of mostly dialogue, so... <laughs> that we plan to fully voice act for everyone's enjoyment and or experience. It is, it is a visual novel, so there's going to be several different paths you can take. So there's a lot to say, depending on what the player chooses. Yeah. Now, of course, everyone, this is the lovely Nancy Situ. You heard her as Kumi Okazaki in Card Fight Vanguard G. And if you played Omen of Sorrow on the PS4, you heard her as Ragagonda. Really hard to be a German gar gar gargoyle. Did you know? Did you know that gargoyles have like this really awful gravel, and you have to do it for three hours to get all the lights out? Gravel? There's nothing wrong with a little gravel. Stop showing up. <laughs> you make me feel small. Wait a second. I was about to say. <laughs> Anyway, getting back on topic, um, she grew up loving sound and music and animation. She enjoys singing in the shower and into a microphone. And of course, she cries during Shinkai movies. Okay, anyone who doesn't cry during Shinkai movies is harmless. Yeah. <laughs> she's known for her bell-like sound to her voice. And of course, she's Calgary's favorite half elf Yes. It's kind of hard to be the favorite half albino if you're the only one here. Well, technically by default, that makes you the favorite and the least favorite. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. Okay, so what, what got you into voice acting? What got me into voice acting? Well, uh, when I started out in acting, I, like many people, was a theater rat. Um, started in school, doing the school plays all the time, and eventually worked my way up to eventually doing films and such and then a friend of mine sent me uh, an ad for a local company that was doing voice acting training and said you know what man i think you'd do great at this 
And I went there and took a course and the first scene they had me do was, it was me and a guy uh, up in front of the mic. We were doing a, like a dub scene of the original Dragon Ball when it was Goku fighting Piccolo. And there was no dialogue, it was all fighting noises. And it was doing like a three minute scene of just hoo ha and you know, all those various sorts of combat noises and such. And after that scene, I was like, yep, I wanna do this. <laughs> How about you? Uh, if I was being perfectly honest, uh, it was because watching Reboot as a child made me fall in love with it. Um, at some point, I worked at a company that created digital media, and they said, oh, we just need someone. We shot a short film. We need someone to fill in for the voices, because the short film uh, doesn't show any of the talking happening. We've already shot it all. But the, the short film centers over a phone interview between a man and a woman, and we just need someone to fill in the voices. You have a voice. Do you wanna just come up to this microphone and just do some dialogue? And it was like very dramatic dialogue, because it was about like a, it was about an urban myth oh. that had been circulating around. And they were like, we found this phone interview, and it was very mysterious. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we also tried to record it in a brick building <laughs> in the triangle intersection of three CP rail train tracks. <laughs> so what you're saying is the audio quality was unmatched. We took everyone's coats and we hung them up like around the microphones. <laughs> uh, and then the trains started coming by. So we, we had to tell them, okay, well, we we're not doing this. Well, let's do this on like a Sunday or something. Did you know trains still run on Sunday? Yes, <laughs> yes I did. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that's how I got into it. And then after that, it was like, oh, hey, we need an IDR. Like, oh yeah, that's right, that's a thing. Uh, we need you to, to be the on hold voice. Can you just be extra nice? People are on hold. They don't want to listen to someone trying to sell them something. Just be nice. And then it just sort of took off from there. Uh, I started dabbling in commercials. I started dabbling in like educational stuff and then animation. I worked at such like animation, Blue Water Studios for a while and Carpet Vanguard. Uh, and then after that, it was just, okay, well, cool. Uh, choices here in Calgary can be limiting. So I'm just gonna do everything on the internet. And that's just where it went. The internet has made the world a much smaller place, which means that you can be on the same stage as people from France. Italy, uh, people from Australia. Uh, I've been in projects for game studios from Chile. So very, very small world. Yeah. I can tell you from my own experience that I've done gigs for clients in three different continents, kind of thing, and my voice has been to more places in the world than I have. <laughs> Me it's, too. It's kind of one of the things that I want to do when I, you know, retire, when if, is that Essentially, I would love to travel the world and catch up, and go to all the places where my voice has been that I haven't. Mm. So, because you're an on-camera actor, do you want to tell me about what the difference is between camera acting and voice acting? Well, let's see. With stage and theater, I can tell you there's a grand benefit that you have that the voice actor doesn't get. Because the stage and the film actor you're visibly shown, show, so you get to physicalize everything, and you get to, you know, show your expressions and make your physical motions, and you know, make your presence there. The voice actor is you're by yourself in a booth, and they don't see you. Um, you're to, lucky if you even get to hear someone else. Exactly. So generally speaking, when you're in the booth there, you have to do everything that the stage and the film actor does but you only get your voice to do it. Now, you might be doing a character and, you know, if you're doing like an anime or a video game, yeah, there's the character on the screen, but you have to make yourself believable into that character so that people buy in. I mean, I'm sure all of us in here have heard, you know, the odd dub or game where it's like, really, that's the voice you went with or something like that? Can someone give me a couple examples of something we have heard recently that just really fell flat for them? The Gundam Z remake! Oh! <laughs> Ooh, that's fire. Ooh. <laughs> Most of the voices from Xenoblade 2. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know, some some of the some of the more historically bad voices, like, you know, there's 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 very, very many examples. Let's try not to tread all over them. But there a, a lot of those also stem from a time when we used to do dubbing differently. We used to just lock an actor in a room and say, here's your script. I just want you to avoid to, to do these lines. If it was even an actor in the first place. Yes, it could have been the director's nephew. Yep, there are definitely many examples of people, uh, various directors and producers, going into the office and just grabbing anybody and simply saying, hey, you've got a voice, get in front of this microphone, you're going to play this character. And thankfully, those days are, well, they're not 100% gone, let's be honest, but they are definitely going away because the demand from modern audiences now is they expect higher quality performance and production. And you wanted to say something? Well, I was going to say the Alice Borderlands that I've been seeing. Ooh, ooh. That was that was brutal because like it just doesn't even touch the voice of Alice. So, won't eat, I won't yeah. watch that one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you watch it in the original language and then just do the subs, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's actually a really good mm -hmm. story. It's just the voices. In my opinion, and I'm usually not very nitpicky about this, but it, well, I appreciate you yeah. calling that one out. Okay, so because of the way that technology has changed the way that we do dubbing and voice acting, even when it's not dubbing, uh, if you're doing something for an original animation, it's prelay, and in the old days, it was all of the actors gathered around, we shared some microphones, we all had the script, and we had to prelay for an animation that hadn't been done yet. So uh, we were kind of lucky if you got, like, oh, this is what your character looks like. Like, I think I, I got really, I got really lucky, I got to see some storyboards for what I was recording for, but like some people are like, yeah, they're, they're a brunette. Like, okay, cool, what kind of person are they? Like, oh, well, um, the writer's not done writing that section yet, can we just record the, t the trailer? Can we just get some, some lines for the trailer? And you're like, uh, uh, okay, I'll do my best. Is this what you want? Like, Tr traditionally, in this day and age, most of the time, if you're lucky, you get it's like, you'll go to audition and it's like, here's a picture, here's some lines, here's a basic description kind of thing. And it's like, okay, you might have 15 minutes to come up with something while you're sitting in the waiting room mm -hmm. kind of thing before you get out there in front. Um, but that's more on the professional level. Sometimes with indie stuff, it's send them a random example and see what happens kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, just, we, what did we get? We got a voice sample and they were like, can you do like Catwoman? from this specific movie, and you're like, uh, okay, okay, yeah, I can, I can. What's your motivation? Oh, don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> do, you have, do you have any lines? No, just say something. Yeah, just say something for me. It's like, oh, this isn't gonna go well. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about some of the different industries. So voice acting is something that's under the voice over umbrella. So voice over kind of spans a lot of things. Uh, commercials, IBRs, talking tech. If anyone here has bought a small child a talking toy anytime in the last like 15 years, somebody gave that voice to that toy. Uh, as annoying or cute as it may sound, someone had to do that and now it's, now it is playing through uh, a nephew's playroom, you know, every Saturday at 3 p.m. because it's the only time they're allowed to turn that on. <laughs> Uh, there's, you know, there's educational stuff, like uh, if anyone has started a new job anytime recently and you were like, hey, we need you to do some training, okay, what, what's the training? We sit you in front of a computer and you gotta watch these videos, okay, cool, I can do that, I can watch Netflix for like eight hours for, the, for my first day, it's like, oh no, it's, it's gonna be this really dry material and this voice is gonna guide you through it, yes? Yeah, I used to do training for our state play that I work there. And Very nice. And let me tell you, I hear that voice in my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which, um, which, which is part of the mark of the skill of the voice so actor. Don't get me started on self checkouts. Yeah, <laughs> is you can get the most driest, boring material of all time, like mind-numbingly painful, but you have to make it as interesting as possible because if, if people are paying attention and grabbing on your every word, but regardless of the content kind of thing, then you've succeeded kind of thing. Thank you for coming to Costco. <laughs> <laughs>
Would you like to buy a plastic bag today? <laughs> yes. We've all heard the robot voices. Um, other styles, of course, of voice acting that are out there. Um, radio dramas, as well as podcasts, have been making a really big resurgence in the last five years. Oh, yeah. Um, and, of course, the one that everybody knows and loves, of course, is like animation, video games, stuff like that. Now, I'm going to pose a question to everybody here, take, just as a guess. So, take animation, video games, all that work combined versus everything else. What do you think the percentage of animation type work is compared to everything else? Out of 100%. 3%. No, no, a little, little bit more than that. 20. 20. 20. 20. So it's about 20. Oh. It's, about, it's about 20. Oh. I, heard, I heard some 20s, yeah. so okay, you got it. About 20% <laughs> it's roughly. About 20. How many of the voiceover talent out there do you think are auditioning for that 20% work? Yeah. 100%. Like 90%. <laughs> if not 150%, practically, because <laughs> the joys of it is everybody wants to get into animation and video games. It's, I mean, hell, we go to cons, we see, we meet our heroes who play various characters and such in these games, and you know, we want to be there with them, kind of thing. And it means it's very stiff competition and studios are picky. Uh, and audiobooks. Has anybody listened to audiobooks? Yeah. Yeah. Has anyone ever tried listening to a university level physics textbook? Oh, yes. Yeah. Someone had to record that. And they had to make it interesting. That was more painful recording or having to listen to it. Well, that depends. Are you also doing your own editing? Because a lot of voice actors have to do their own editing. Oh, I know. I'm working on that, actually. Yeah. There you go. It's, it can be some. Essentially, you could record for an hour and edit for six, pretty much, just trying to get it right, and then that doesn't even count for your recording. Yes, but did you say all of those biological component names properly? Because if you didn't, you're re-recording the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> Alright, so, you want to get into voice acting, and I think that's awesome. Where do you get started? What kind of equipment should people look into? Because one of, the first, one of the first questions we always get is, how nice of a microphone do I need to have? Yep. How expen How much money am I dropping? Is usually the question people are most interested in. If you wanted to pick up violin for the very first time in your life, would you go for the highest quality Italian violin you could find? Do you want a Strad for your birthday? Yeah, okay, cool. New mortgage. Yeah. <laughs> new mortgage at the new Bank of Canada interest rate prices. Um, no. Does, does you all have one of these? Yeah. All of these will record your voice at a decent quality, might I add. Uh, did you know that a lot of people are sending in like studio auditions on their phones right now? Because when you're traveling, you can do that. The most important thing you can do to increase the quality of your sound is to treat the space around you. Please do not send in a Disney princess audition singing in the bathroom. That is the worst possible, as good as it sounds when you're in the shower, and I know. <laughs> it's not the best place to be recording for audio quality. So what you do is you build a pillow fort. <laughs> pillow fort, couch fort, convert a closet. I mean, we've all got Ton of clothing usually, I, so you I can used get to, it all in there. I used to use my walk-in closet, which I don't have anymore, by the way. I did not think I would miss having a walk-in closet uh, until I moved to a place that didn't have one, and now I have to build a booth that is not in just like a room, like a fully enclosed room that I can just multi-purpose. Uh, and that's the other thing: is is your space going to be a pillow fort for like ninety percent of the time? Then, then. Think about maybe like dedicating space to it or not i don't know it's pandemic it depends too on your living space who you're sharing your you know house apartment 
Hey you Sean, know. you don't mind if I just like make a pillow for forever, right? Or just a giant booth. <laughs> I mean, it would be a great use for all the really decorative pillows that you buy at cons. Just put them all over the walls. Mm. There you go. Oh, natural. If, could I, could I hire you to build me a booth with just body pillows? <laughs> yes. Yes. yes, I will do that. I love this idea. I, huh? Not in our house. <laughs> We've got a backyard. I just have to build it, and then I just have to deconstruct it, bring it to their place. Yeah, yeah. there you yeah. go. There you go. Now, there you go. Innovation. Yeah. Now, I mean, with a cell phone and a pillow fort of sorts, you can definitely get started, and you can definitely get out there and start auditioning and auditioning. working. It's not one of those things where, at some point in time, yes, you will definitely have to invest in yourself. It, but it, it is an investment. Yeah. It, you can't you can't go out and buy a nine thousand dollar road microphone and expect it to pay off right away when you haven't mastered all of the techniques that you need to use it and to sound good using it. Justin has thoughts. For the bit parts and the catbird seat, you probably might did not know that, but that was my closet and I thought when I just did those two lines. Yeah, and that's perfectly <laughs> fine. The bit it works. And I didn't want to go to the trouble of going to the studio to do it. Yeah. And then there's, it's there's a trade off And it there. worked and it was broadcast media. Yeah. Broadcast nobody quality, knew. everyone. Nobody, right there. Nobody, nobody knew the difference. No. no. And I mean, most people wouldn't pick it out unless you're well trained. Um, the thing is that with with this, with voice acting, you will have to look at it, look at it as an investment in yourself. Because eventually the cell phone and the pillow fort will only get you so far. I mean, will, you will outgrow it, and it, yeah. it is you outgrowing your current equipment. It's not, oh, well, I don't want to hire this guy because his microphone is just like a $10 microphone. It's that that $10 microphone is now beyond your capability to sound even better. Yeah, and if it, I mean, for those that, you know, want to get a microphone right away, there's a lot of USB mics, 50 to 100 bucks, maybe 150 if you go on the high end like, you know, Blue Yetis, Snowballs, etc. Um, they're definitely a great next step up kind of thing. Um, because of USB mics, you just plug them into your computer or laptop and just have the mic in your treated space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So speaking of investments, uh -oh. you know what's really expensive? <gasps> Education. Yeah, it's true. But with a nice microphone comes skill to use it. A nice microphone will make everyone sound really nice, but are you and your your capacity for emoting is your ability to perform on a very technical level, is that up to snuff for that microphone? If you get to a point where you're like, I deserve a five thousand dollar upgrade to my equipment, Mike. Hey, you got Sean over there, he can pay for it. Come on, it's your project. It's your project. Uh, Come on. Fine. Um, Come on. It, it's, it's the whole thing with this market and such. Like, education is probably one of the most important things to get in voice acting. You definitely want to gain the acting skills, especially if you have never been a theater actor or you've never been a film actor or you've never gone out and done improv and stuff like that. All of these are relevant skills that will help, kind of thing. And any performance skill is cross-transferable. I used to be classically trained in singing. What has that done for me? Apparently, I have very good breath control. I didn't realize this until someone else pointed it out. But that is what I do when I get in front of a microphone. I use the principles I learned in singing. Can I add something onto that that yeah. one of my instructors told me? If in this industry, if you're not working, you're taking classes. Very true. If you're not working on a project, you're dedicating time on getting better, yes. on perfecting your craft. Yeah, which can be simply doing work at home where you can take the newspaper and just read articles and such out loud, of course. But the idea is like, take an article, doesn't matter what the content of it is, and you gotta work on it in different ways. To one, make it sound interesting, but also to develop emotional range. Um, 
Emotional range, especially if you want to do character work, is incredibly important. Um, because if you can sound very convincing, happy, but when you go into a sad scene, nobody believes you. It's 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 very interesting place to be. Um, Megan knows this, but I was a very like a very low key child. I had a lot of like trouble getting really excited about stuff, which is definitely not the case anymore. Uh, but it was just it. I, I felt like it was a very difficult feeling to express, despite feeling excited. And there is a little bit of sort of inner work that you do as an actor to find those those emotions in yourself and bring them to the surface, and then only using your voice express it because no one's seeing you, and no one will have the luxury of seeing you as gorgeous as you all are. Unfortunately, they don't get to see. You. No, and it's the more times you do it, the stronger the skill gets, the better you become. So it's usually something I recommend to a lot of people is take a book, take a newspaper, pick something, and it's like, record yourself doing three passes at it. The first one, happy as can be. Second one, incredibly sad. And the third one, angry. Because those are the three most common emotions when it comes to acting. And those are the three you want to nail for certain, because every other emotion branches off one of those three kind of thing. And like I said, it doesn't matter what the content is. It's actually even better if you can find something that it's like, oh, this is sad and depressing, but I have to do it really happy like kind of thing, because it shows the skill and it, it'll show the skill, show development, but it can also help you down the road when you get something that you look at this piece and your internal head is saying, no, 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 I need to do it this way. But the director's like, no, 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 you're doing it this way. And it is a very valuable skill to be directable. You need to be malleable. You need to be able to adapt. If you get into a booth and you're already mentally locked into how you think you should be doing the script and that's the way you do it and you do it great, but the director wants something different from you, that's probably where you're going to stop and that's where you're going to hit a wall and that's where they're going to find that maybe that's not the level of flexibility they need for that role. So we've, I'm sure you and I have both seen this, um, people who've gotten into the booth, they did a really great first take and then they weren't able to take direction. Weren't able to take direction or they were, in some cases, they just don't have the skill or the ability in order to do anything other than the one way they can do it. Right, and that, that's where it's really important to be taking a lot of really good quality training and getting a lot of good practice. Because you're gonna have to get really good at self-directing yourself if you wanna know what people who are directing you are hearing. Do you hear it in yourself? And that is something that a lot of people will struggle with when they get started. I don't like hearing recordings of myself, and I hear that a lot from people that I mentor. I just like, they, they cringe every time they hear recordings of themselves. Uh, but if other people are telling you that you sound great, that's a mental barrier you have to work on getting over yourself. Yep. Uh, love thy own voice is always something that's important. I know we've probably all at least met somebody that says they hate the sound of their natural voice. Yes, but you're not allowed to use the Nelf voice ever again. Yes. Ever again. Uh, Unless you have to. All or right. your version of Mr. Fitwilder. <laughs> Well, the Nelf voice is for a project that Nancy and I are both working on called On the Line. It's a villainous character that I play, and I will give you an example because I know if I don't, someone's going to ask I'm going to wait because I'll do a spit take. <laughs> it's like... Greetings, everyone, and glad you could all come here to my piano today. Every time. Every time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's great. Yeah. It, it's, it's, and it, I give Mike crap for it every time. But that's what he's supposed to do. That's what the voice is. It's awful. It's supposed to make you feel that way. And, and it's a basic principle of acting that I can tell you all is that the two important things that you want in acting is, of course, there's the entertainment value, but the other thing is you always want a reaction out of your audience. If they feel a reaction, whether it's positive or negative, that doesn't matter. The idea is that they react and they feel something for your performance. Yep. Okay, so practice. Um, 
I just read everything, including road signs. If I'm driving along, I'll just read every road sign because I can. Uh, uh, did, you, did you receive the community newsletter? Well, I did, and apparently in the hills today, we are accepting new applications for gym membership. <laughs> That sounds immensely uninteresting. How can I read this to sound interesting? Um, just go to any auditions that you see online. There are tons of free, you know, unpaid projects that are, hey, those are just free audition lines for you to try practicing with. Go do it. And then if you're feeling really good, try submitting it and see what happens. Because if you like what you hear, why not? Give it a shot. You're not going to get a role unless you start submitting anyway, so. Yeah, which may come as a bit of a shock to the introverts in the room, but you will have to put yourself out there a little. I, I know it's one of those things that if you were a shy person, it's something that you're going to have to learn to overcome it, even if it's just to audition. Oh no. Exactly. It's just, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Just to be simplistic. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious. Um... So for auditioning, uh, et cetera, uh, there are obviously a lot of online auditions that you mm -hmm. can do. Mm -hmm. um, for getting to the next level professionally, if you mm -hmm. have all the training and the like, um, casting workbook and actor and that sort of thing, do you have to go through those processes or are there still like places that you get your auditions from that are not those? There are so many paid gigs on the internet that aren't through Actra, that aren't through an Actra union. The, the, the non-union work in this day and age is so much bigger than union work now. Now, certain major studios that we all know, because we watch their shows, play their games, will you have to be union? Most likely. Um, however, the, the indie game market and a lot of other companies, to be blunt, they don't want to pay union rates because union rates are expensive. And, and that is like a, an up to being in a union. If you think it is worth your time and your money and your investment to be in a union, then, then you have to decide to make that trade off yourself. For me, not worth it for me. Okay, okay we're both not in union. I'm not in a union, are you? No, I'm not in a union. Hey, we should make our own union. <laughs> what? I would actually take care of people. What a fabulous idea! Yeah. Quick, everyone, pay us dues! <laughs> um, it, it's a reality of the industry, though, that when you first start out, you are likely working for free. It, it's just something to be blunt and forward about. It is not a bad thing. It is not. It's a lot of good practice. Um, and it's a really interesting way to experience being in an audio production without the inherent attachment of like actual employment. You know what it's like when you when you join, you know, the XYZ company, you kind of find out you're not really a fan of your employer, but you feel kind of stuck there. If you're gonna be part of a free production, the chances are that it's probably run by people who are very passionate about that specific, either it's a fandom or it's an original work, and it's probably their baby and they will love it and you'll probably get fantastic experience from that energy. Yeah. And one of the things that I can definitely tell you is a lot of people on the internet that are indie creators, regardless of whatever it is they're creating, a lot of them spend long, lonely hours and such, and they need friends. And I can tell you from personal experience, making friends with these creators is the way to get in on the inside track. Because a lot of these people, if you make friends with them, they will. It's not in the sense that you're guaranteed anything, but the odds of you getting a role over some Joe Blow that they've never heard of before are significantly higher. And, and that's not to say that you're not genuine friends with these people, because creatives are sometimes, yeah, this sounds very cliche, but creatives are just very under, misunderstood sometimes. And, and being a friend to, to other creatives have led me to some of the most meaningful friendships that I've ever had the pleasure of being friends with. <laughs> and like, and, and again, it's just, you meet all these wonderful people. If you're gonna work with them, be friends with them. And you know, friends are going to get you far, especially if you care the same way they do. 
Oh yeah. If you get invested in their projects and they're invested in you, you'd be amazed how far you'll get kind of thing. And you know, maybe the first gig doesn't pay kind of thing. Maybe the second gig doesn't pay, but you know, maybe one day when they're on their fifth or seventh project and they actually get a budget and they're going somewhere, they'll remember you. Loyalty is enormous in this industry. I mean, Justin back there is a friend of mine. Uh, he did Dark Side Drive, which was a radio drama series that we did at CJSW here in town. And you didn't get paid the first season? No, we didn't get paid for the first season. I went in and auditioned for a part, um, got it, and then because he and I worked together and did, uh, you know, formed a working friendship and wrote that, I went from only having one gig to eventually 11 gigs kind of thing. And it's like me and one other guy out of our little pool of actors, you know, we're tied for the most appearances in the show kind of thing. And it's not to brag, but it's the sense that because I spent the time and the effort, and it's a genuine thing. It's showed not, up. And it, that too, you know, <laughs> you know, showed up, was there, was passionate, put in the work, the effort and such. Yeah, I got continuous work and it was always a blast. And it's always that thing where it's like, yeah, Justin and I talk probably about three or four times a week at least kind of thing because we're sharing ideas and collaborating on stuff. And the creative industry is always creating. It's kind of in the name. If you are finding that there just isn't a project for you that you love, make it. Go out there and make it yourself. Uh, I, will, I will talk about this a little bit because I can, because we're running this panel. I keep forgetting this. But <laughs> a lot of people that I know who start out as voice actors because they love the idea of voice acting, they get into it, love it, but then they go, but I would love to work on something like this, with this in it, with big space battles and uh, long like soap opera-esque things and political intrigue and interesting character development. And then I go to them and I say, cool, write it, produce it, I'll work for you. Do this thing, I know you can do it. There you go. You can be a programmer, right? <laughs> Yeah. Sure, why yeah, not? we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We can add another hat on the head, so well, to speak. Like, so, so very many career paths sort of diverge off of being a voice actor. A lot of people discover they love directing other voice actors. They're good at it. They can elicit the exact thing that they need out of the voice actor to really enrich that performance. They go the director route. Some people decide to become producers. They just they have a grand idea, and they just need to put together the right team to make it a reality. Some people go into writing and are really good at it and throw puns everywhere and make me cringe. And, and then I end up laughing myself into a fit because it ends up being so funny when the punchline eventually hits. I don't know, does it? I'll let you think on that. But yeah, it's the thing is that everything that you can contribute is to the good. It's one of those things that voice acting is more than just voice acting. It's a whole system kind of thing. And the more that you can contribute into the system, the more you'll get out of it. You ever been burned by, by some pretty bad red flags though? I ask this right. because oh, I know God. I'm segueing into it, but I know because I've been in a project with Mike that horrendously imploded. Wow. Just in the most spectacular, dramatic, egocentric way that you can imagine, this whole very large, promising project just imploded on itself. And there were red flags. There were so many red flags. But you don't see them until you and the other actors start talking. Yep. So what are some things we should be watching for? Uh, let's see. Let me think, 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 think. Uh, poorly written scripts. Yep, that's... That is, that is usually my number one tip off. Um, does the script not make sense? Does it sound like it was written by a writer or does it sound like it was written by someone who has more of a junior high level grasp of English? <laughs> does it sound like the story is going somewhere? What kind of character profiles were you given when you auditioned? 
uh, what were your audition slides like? Were they um, actual script excerpts? Or did someone just tell you to say a couple of lines that you think will fit? Because there's a lot of auditions online that are like, this character sounds like this character from this other animated show, like Miraculous Ladybug. But grab the ear. Just say something that you think will fit. And the, the classic one, of course, that you can see a lot is, uh, don't worry, I will pay you, just not right now kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Where it can be that whole, oh yeah, 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 no worries, I'm good for the money, no yeah. problem, man, I just keep sending them in, keep sending them in, keep sending them in, block. Mm -hmm. I'll pay you an exposure. Oh, exposure. I love that saying because uh, we literally just told you that like 10 minutes ago. 10 minutes ago, it was like, hey, this is good practice. No one should be promising you that they're paying you an exposure. Your time is worth something. And if you find out that you're on a project that you don't think is worth your time, that's a decision you gotta make. Yeah, you don't need to stay on a bad project for the sake of being on a project. Yes. So because you said that brief, free projects can be a good thing for both practice and experience, mm -hmm. but then also them saying that they may or may not pay you is a red flag. How do you tell the difference between the projects that are, because there's always going to be free projects, how do you yep. tell the difference between the ones that are kind of sketchy and the ones that are genuinely like, yeah, it's a free project, but this is right, the cool. number one thing. Were they honest with you? Are you, okay, if someone came up to me and said, I have a role that I really, really want you to be, but I will be honest, I don't have money for it right now. If we get uh, two episodes launched, and then we, we put up like a Kickstarter, a Patreon, an Indiegogo, uh, I'm gonna start using that money to fund you and the other actors. This is my business plan, I have a plan. Do they have a plan? Because if they don't, chances are this project's just gonna fall apart. It's that, or you get the people out there that they go out there and they get a whole cast of voice actors, and then you're like, okay, great, I've got this part, where's the script? Oh, it's not done yet. Yeah. Where you, you'll get a lot of time wasters kind of thing, where yeah, it sounds great, it sounds like it's gonna be a project, and there's literally there's nothing kind of thing. Um, the other thing, the other way that also just to jump back to a point I made, um, if you want to know if somebody's sketchy or not, well, we obviously don't have built-in lie detectors. Getting to know the creators is also a way that can help with that. Now, you can't always play 20 questions with everybody, but getting to know somebody and seeing how they react to even just standard questions can make a huge difference. Because if, if you have any sort of red flag or thing going off in your head, Bam. Um, I, I know this is probably going to be a somewhat uncomfortable question, but has anyone dealt with a narcissist? Okay. If someone interacts with you on what should be a professional basis and narcissist flags are coming up, does it sound like the things they say don't quite line up? Are they telling you lies? If you're not comfortable with them, I don't recommend trusting them. And you know what? There are projects a million out there. You don't need to stick with this one. If this project falls apart, there's going to be hundreds that spring up in its wake. There's no reason that you need to tie yourself to a doomed project being led by someone who does not have your best interest in mind. Someone who is making a project of the scale that you're thinking about, they should have thought about all this already. And there's there's no good human out there who's going to who should be willing to throw you under the bus. So if they don't come across the board like they're a good human to you, just drop it. Like, no hurt feelings. Just, I don't think this project is for me. Yes? So I know as a beginner, you want to start off as a freelancer and mm -hmm. you set your own rate, but as a professional, would you say joining a union like Actra would be beneficial to a voice actor? It's one of those things with the union is, yes, there's the, it depends on where you are in your career. To be honest, like if you've got a handful of projects under your belt and you get an invite, you need to seriously think about it because Actra are touch territorial when it comes to what their performers can do, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Like 
yeah, they'll send you things for union work, which is great. But if your buddy comes up and says, hey, can you come work for me on my indie thing? Union not so friendly on that sort of thing. No, now you can, you can get exceptions. Sometimes they'll give you permission, but other times they'll be like, nope, you're union. You only do union. We have to keep the union strong. And it's- Again, unions have their benefits. They really, really do but it has to make sense for you. Yeah, if you jump into a union too early, you can hurt yourself in the industry because it's just to throw an old Greek uh, legend out there, you know, about Icarus and flying too close to the sun kind of thing, melting his wax wings. It happens to a lot of actors because they get on, a, they get in as a non-union actor on a union project, they get the invite and they think, great, I'm on my way to, you know, fame, fortune, stardom, etc., and they crash and burn. Good Can question. I tell my union story about Dark Side Drive? Because I think this is absolutely... <laughs> sure. Okay, sure. why not? So, season two was paid. We, we had a budget. Mm -hmm. I called Actra, and I said, let's, let's get a contract going. I will take the exact same as the producer of the show. I'll take the same contract that you offer CBC actors. Mm -hmm across the board, and they didn't want a deal. They just said no. And I said, well then, I'll take those rates and double them, and I'll still get your actors. And I did. There were actor actors that were getting paid twice the we were paid at CBC, um, using the pseudonyms as names. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, it, you know, they, they, they're very protective uh, and, and can actually not get people work, too. Yes. So, uh, yeah. If you are in a union, you are not allowed to accept non-union work unless it's not an acting credit, I believe. Like, you could be a writer for somebody, yeah, but you, you couldn't be listed as an actor. You, you, you can't contribute to the voice acting of a project. You can get special permission, but that's yeah. not easy. Not easy, no. 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 Good questions and good stories. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about accents? So we have a very lovely international host of people visiting this weekend. And I often get asked, I have XYZ accent, Australian, or I have like a really thick Brooklyn accent. Is that going to hurt me? Uh, and the answer is just genuinely no. There's always someone who is looking for that very particular sound. And the fact that it's a native accent gives it authenticity, which is something that's really, really important to the acting industry these days. A lot more people are putting out casting calls explicitly asking for BIPOC actors to be in a BIPOC position role. Uh, or they want someone who is like natively Australian to sound like this one Australian character. They don't want a non-authentic accent. Yeah, the representation now, I mean, if you've been on the internet and been seeing a lot of the anime websites and some of the controversies that have been going around these days. Yeah, there, there's been a big cry for having the actual people, you know, BIPOCs playing the actual, those actual characters rather than just Joe Blow white guy, uh, you know. Can you sound his... black for me? It's like, this is, this is just, wow, okay. Yeah. Uh, no, so that is a huge, like, no, no these days. Like, no, do not do that. Just. There are so many BIPOC actors, why aren't you targeting them? And so that, that authenticity is actually much, much to your advantage. Uh, there are significantly more roles that I do not qualify for than the ones that I do, significantly more. There are ones that are very specific about exactly what ethnicity they want. They want people specifically from like Southern Mexico. They want people specifically from like the North of Italy. It's very specific now. Yeah. But it, regardless of who you are and what your background is, there is work for everyone Yeah. kind of thing. Like, don't feel disheartened that, you know, it's like, well, like me, I'm obviously a white guy kind of thing. And it's like, no, trust me, there's still plenty of work out there. You don't have to worry that, oh, I'm going to be fit into this tiny little niche piece. No, it's one of those things you may have to look a little harder, but that's, there's so many casting calls out there, you can easily find. And the, the one advantage I will say about being a voice actor over a film or theater actor is, well, film and theater, yeah, sometimes your physical look 
is more important than anything else. Nobody cares in voice acting. Like people go in and into the booth in studios and they're wearing their PJs kind of thing. They don't have their hair done, their makeup's non-existent kind of thing, but they still get work because it's the voice that matters and their acting skill. And, and you know, your professionalism and your oh, ability to be a good, genuine human to other people, because if you get cut out in this industry, it's really hard to get back in. It's hard to redeem yourself if you've been a bad human to people. Yeah. People in this industry have insanely good memories. <laughs> so screw, screwing people over for petty reasons that because you just decided to be a jerk one day when you went into the studio, don't remember that. Uh, speaking of casting calls, what are good places and like keywords and things of just like how do you find casting calls? What's a good way to go about it? Ooh, so uh, Casting Call Club is a, a great place for beginners to go because there's just tons of auditions. There is that are a website? Castingcall.club. Uh, lots and lots and lots of places for someone to get started and start practicing. There are tons of like little passion projects that people are doing or uh, sometimes you get um, like animation students who are just like looking to finish their, their, their final capstone and that they need actors for things like that. Sorry, you said casting called dot club? I think so. Is yes. it not dot club anymore? Um, it is dot club um, still. Okay. I'm, I'm just noting it. Yes. yes. I'm just um, spelling this right. Okay, I was like, oh no, did they change the, the URL? Oh no. The, it is, yep. Two other places that I can highly recommend because I found a lot of gigs even for us on them. Uh, hilariously enough, Facebook. There is a lot of voice acting groups on there. Much to my chagrin because I deleted my Facebook account like a year and a half ago and, <laughs> yeah, and so now I'm like not worth it. permanently locked out. Yeah, exactly. It was yeah, so every, every time I find one for her, I have to, you know, copy paste it into Discord for yeah, her. Yeah, pretty much. Just, just so she can audition for yes. them. Yes, absolutely. Um, the other one uh, is actually Twitter. Um, there are so many indie game companies on Twitter, and a lot of them have their DMs open. So you can talk to them, you can get to know them, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, if you love indie studios, and you see like an indie video game studio just like chatting it up on Twitter, and you're like, hey, you're really cool. I'm gonna follow you, I'm gonna see how this is going, I'm gonna have lots of interesting things to say about it, and then one day when they go, we're gonna start casting for XYZ MC, and we need people to start submitting. Here, please, please hit me up for info, for auditions, for whatever. Uh, and then you can be there and you will be, hey, I've been following you for like seven months. I love what you're doing with your atmospheric rendering. It's beautiful. I would love to be part of this project. And this is going back to being friends and getting on the inside lane. It can definitely, might not guarantee your role, but it might guarantee that your audition gets listened to. And, and to be frank, uh, that doesn't mean that you're just gonna go around and try and befriend everyone. Like, no. we're, we're talking about establishing like really good professional relationships with people. Yes, yes, the creative industry is an amazing place for such meaningful friendships. Let those friendships happen naturally. But you know, go out there, be professional. You know, you're not you're not out you're not you're not gonna find more people if you stay in a bubble. That doesn't mean that I want all the introverts in the world uh, in this room anyway to just you stop being an introvert. That's not what I mean. But y'all can look left and right and be like, you are interested in voice acting. Do you want to like practice or on Discord or something together? Do you want to like go mob Mike on Discord and be like, hey, what you working on? And that would be a long-winded answer. Do you want to go <laughs> ask Nancy about how to do this line better? Yeah. Like hit us up. The, We're here for you. The local community here, like in Calgary, is it enormous? No, but it's bigger than you might think. And I can tell you from my personal experience, eight years ago, I was on your guys' side of the room here. And I was looking up at the local voice actors, like Brendan Hunter, for example, who's a guest here. I went up to him, he was a guest at Expo that year, and I went up to his booth and I said, I want to be a voice actor, please tell me how, kind of thing. And not only did we become friends and such, but we have worked together on several projects and he has trained me as one of the few many teachers I've had in order to become a better actor and voice actor kind of thing. 
And it's why making connections with the local talents is not a bad thing. Because generally speaking, we're willing to help you. We've been there. We know what you guys are going through. Um, and now we're here trying to help you guys get to the next stage. Yeah, we're, we're paying it forward now because, you know, with all of our friends that helped us, now we want to help you guys find a thing. Question. Oh, I kind of like just recently, recently hit Tim, Tim in, so I guess, guess I should, uh, let's see, so what, well, I guess you, you, you will have to, of course you have to answer the question I have mine. Uh, what, so what, so I guess this is a question for both of you, what got you involved in voice acting? Okay, well, um, yeah, what got me into voice acting, just to expand upon it further to add a new tidbit, um, when I was a kid, uh, back in the day when video games didn't have voice acting in it, I know, scary, kind of thing, with a lot of text-based games, I used to love, I still love, but I played a lot of RPGs, JRPGs, and in my head, I would hear a lot of the voices, kind of thing. Now, it might not be ones I could actually do, but for me, it was a part of it, and I've been, since you weren't here, I've been acting since I was five kind of thing and I went through theater and film and when I got to voice acting and such like I did a training course um, where it was I played Goku in a scene where it was Goku versus Piccolo we did a fight scene no lines got hooked kind of thing and for me that was it like I've been pursuing this wholeheartedly now for eight years and I've gotten lots of gigs made tons of great contacts and friends and uh, yeah uh, I happened to be in the right place at the right time. Someone had already finished shooting a short film about an urban myth, and they just needed the voice added in. And I happened to be there, and I said I would give it a try. And uh, it turns out I loved it, so I started doing it a lot more. Uh, I was very fortunate to be working at a company that was already producing a lot of creative media. So I already had access to a lot of photographers, videographers, people who were in the local film scene. I got to be a zombie once. I had the coolest makeup on. It was a terrible time taking it all off. <laughs> terrible time. It was like, like full body paint from like here up. My face was totally white and they had like, you know, uh, cosmetically glued uh, transistors and resistors and chips like all over like my, it was very Borgy. It was a it was a really cool time, uh, but yeah, taking it all off really hurt. <laughs> uh, but it, it's really, I say that because exposure to theater film groups in Calgary was really what got me into it. Because we do have a couple of like radio stations here in town. We have studios here in town that also do like animation uh, and and uh, television. That's that's the one. That's that's the word. Uh, television. Uh, and I got to sort of tangentially work with a whole bunch of them. So I highly recommend, you know, just, just sort of getting yourself into the group. Like it's a really big, wide, creative group here in Calgary. Yeah, and there's also tons of community theater companies as well too. Like go volunteer for a show or go audition for a show, mm -hmm. learn. Uh, if theater Calgary <coughs> puts out lots of really interesting notices on their mailing list. I highly recommend it. That's how I found one of my first singing teachers. That sometimes you hear about certain auditions that they're just they're just looking for someone to, to send in some auditions just just for like a really short little thing that they need. Um, I found out about an art installation that needed voice acting through Brendan, actually. So just just things like that. It's very much about getting yourself into the community and just really becoming part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we should probably talk about one of the aspects of differences in voices where it comes to men versus women when it comes to voice acting. Oh, are we going to go there? Well, we got to talk about it. Somebody's going to ask. Now, okay. now, for all the women in the room, generally speaking, you have an advantage. Women or women identifying? Thank you. You have an advantage over men or male identifying. We do. Yes, we do. Especially when it comes to things like animation and video games. Why, you may ask? Because yeah, why? I actually want to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Generally speaking, what I'm getting at with this is 
There's a lot of young boy characters, especially in anime. Oh, and about 99.9% .9 of them are played by women. Yeah, totally true. 100%. Because most of these characters are not at the age where their voices have cracked and have gotten deep. <laughs> so, yeah, you're not going to see me playing a lot of, uh, you know, young boy characters. It's just not the way, it's just not in the cards for me. At least not in a super convincing way, anyway. Well, unless we're going for a comedy thing here, but... <laughs> anyway, um, 100% true. Uh, people with higher ranges are going to find that they have a little more room to play. You could get a really super squeaky, hyperactive pixie, or you can go a little bit lower and go, like, you know, a little bit sultry. If you do have one of those, like, voices that falls very perfectly in that androgynous range where you're like, you could be feminine leaning or you could sound very masculine. That's a wonderful area to play in because you can go a little higher, you can go a little bit lower. And it's great to hear that, you know, perform live. Like, oh, I love directing those sessions. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and then, you know, men, men also have a little bit of a historical preference too when it comes to radio. Because on radio, uh, a lot of the voices you hear are you know, men, they've got like a deeper bass, they translate well over AM radio. Uh, and that, that's a niche. Like if you've got like a very deep bassy voice and you're great at your diction, you like reading the news for people every day, that's definitely a place you can go. It's true, it's true. It's true, it's true. We got a couple of questions. Yeah, let's start answering questions. We've got like a lot of time for questions today, which I'm loving because we did not have time for questions at Comic Expo. <laughs> yes. So, well, from my very masculine voice, um, is there any tips and tricks you guys have for like neutralizing things like lists and stuff like that? Um. So lists are a very complicated thing. Because some of it is, like some some cases of lisp, I, I am mentoring someone who, who does have a very heavy lisp, or at least is trying to get over it. For them, uh, them, yes, that is their proper pronoun. It took me a second there. Them, for them, um, it is actually to do with the shape of their tongue. Yeah, because like, I'm worried about like, getting pigeonholed with like, like, you know, just a gay guy or something like that. Like, something. Never just a gay guy. Now, I will tell you that Generally speaking, there is a saying that typecast is cast, kind of thing. It, it, it is work. It yes, is it, work. I guess no, is work. No, no, I guess, yes, I get it. If you play character X or X type, you know, 80 million times, can it get boring? Sure. But the you're idea- You're getting paid. You're getting paid. That's the key is yeah. like, now it, it's, it's just a lot of it will come with practice kind of thing and it's, being able, if you're able to, manipulate and play with your voice kind of thing, to do different different accents, different styles of voice, and the emotional range as well kind of thing. Right. I highly recommend for everyone in this room, find your niche first and then start growing outside of it because everyone here already has a voice. It's a very lovely voice and you can emote with it because you're human, you have emotions. Play within your range that you know you can do and then start growing outside of that. Go a little lower, go a little higher. Start changing your diction, start changing the staccatos in the way you speak. Uh, adding and subtracting a list is a, is a very fun way to play with your voice. But you know, you already have a voice, perfect it. Get really good at it, refine it, and then start growing. The, the other thing also to consider too is status of your character. If you're someone who's a very highbrow noble, you're not gonna sound like you're, you know, a street rat kind of thing and vice versa. The idea is you need to get into the character's mindset. You need to know- Their circumstances. Their circumstances, their life story. And you may have to create this on the fly because sometimes they don't give it to you. You've got to figure it out. But. It's that whole thing of, if my character is this, they're more likely to act this way than that way, kind of thing. There's nothing worse than being given a character and they don't act the way they should in the story. That's, that's kind of the, the foundation of really good archetypes. 
If you put Captain America in a room with XYZ person, you should know how he acts. If you're being given a character that's overly ambiguous and doesn't actually act that way, you're gonna find it's really hard to maintain that character. Unless this is supposed to be written that way and they're supposed to experience that growth. But still, within the confines of the writing and the character development, they should be acting a certain way. So once you've figured out that archetype, in your head, apply it. That becomes part of the voice, that becomes part of the performance. And if your director, producer, engineer are worth their salt, they will help you, they will guide you. No, no, uh, just do your own thing, it's fine. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yes, if, if they're terrible, yes, they will just say, nah, 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 you know, go dance on the end of the line and figure it out. <laughs> Ide ideally, yes, if everyone is good and everyone's working harmoniously together, your performance will be stronger kind of thing, because everyone together wants the best for you for and, project, and your project. Or... It's like, if they're there to stick it to you and screw you, why are you there, <laughs> kind of thing. One like, thing to add, mm -hmm. um, I know it helps with people with stutters, you can get apps on your phone that will play back what you're saying slightly out of time, and that's how you can kind of Right, so that, that also plays really well into playing with the cadence of how you talk. Mm -hmm. If you slow down what you're saying at any given time, suddenly you sound very calming and wise. But if you really, really speed it up, oh my gosh, are you the most hyperactive person in this room? I can't stop myself! Play with that. Mm -hmm. if, if slowing down your cadence is what helps you with, you know, if you are having a problem with stutter or anything like pacing yourself, that's the perfect way to practice. Yeah, now, just two things I'll quickly add. Um, especially when you're playing around with range of voice, if it hurts to do a voice, stop. 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 Right it is not worth it. Um, you can damage your voice kind of thing if you practice improperly, if you do not warm up, if you do not prep your voice for a day's worth of work. Um, when I did the ballad singer, I played a character called N. Kalimo, Elven Assassin, and I had to do eight hour sessions. And the voice that I used was, you're an assassin, not a warrior. So eight hours of straight gravel voice. And we had to do like two to three sessions a week because we had tight deadlines. And I can tell you, there was a lot of times I went home and I was sucking on fishermen's friends all night and like tea and honey and stuff like that. So I had a voice for the next day. Protect your instrument. Yeah. Um, this is where you... attacks, too. Those are, those are very hard. Yeah. Like, you may have to do eight hour days and if you cannot maintain a voice for eight hours, it is not in your best interest to Try and stick to it. That or but audition for it. Don't. Like with that voice because people will find out really fast if you can't uh, maintain a voice. Don't be reckless with your instrument. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh gosh. Uh, you've been waiting for a while. Yeah. Yes. Like one comment my voice teacher always says that singing is like a sport, mm -hmm. which I think applies to this too, where you Needs really need to take care of your mm -hmm. voice and how you use it. Yep. yep. Um, secondary question though. Um, is there like a notable difference that should be kept in mind between like radio work auditions and auditions for other things for your voice? What do you mean? Like just because radio is a different experience than something where they can cherry pick what lines you're using? I think they sound very clear on the radio. I just mean audition wise if there is a difference. Um, generally speaking, no. Not for um, the audition aspect, for the live performance aspect, yes. Yeah. There's, there's a significant difference in being able to chop up your lines uh, however you need for an audition and being able to perform live uh, without, you know, uh, tripping over your words. Uh, word, reading comprehension is also very important. It's one of those, like, if this was a job, I would probably classify it as like a hard skill. It is. It is going to let you read your script. You need to have very, very good reading comprehension to keep up, especially if they're just handing you cold reads. The news changes every day and you're gonna be reading the news. It's always different and you don't get a chance to practice it before you gotta go on the radio and say it. Yeah, or maybe if you're lucky, you got five minutes before they shove you on the air, but um, it, it's, it's a skill. Um, generally speaking, once again, the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, audition for tons of different people because you're gonna get different directors, different producers, different people that are gonna come back to you and say, try this, try this, try that. And it's that whole thing of those that have the ability will thrive. Those that don't need to go back and practice until they can. Oh gosh, uh, Sailor Venus has been waiting. Um, so I was just wondering if, um, so I've never done any acting on stage or anything, but I'm really good at doing accents and stuff like that. So is there like, because I feel like a beginner level of voice acting, might I might already be past that. So is there like, a place to fit and stuff like that? I would still recommend taking beginner because okay. while you're very good at accents, you also don't have a lot of the foundational skills for acting. Okay, yeah. Those are very important because you need this to sound convincing. Yeah. You need it to be real, to sound relatable to a human listener. Okay. Right? Yeah, despite, we know it says voice acting, but being able to act is more important than being able to put on a, a voice, voice. Mm -hmm. because yeah. you can have the greatest voice in the world, but if nobody believes you in the role, it's irrelevant <laughs> kind of thing. So I highly recommend taking the introduction. Some of it will probably be some of the things we've already repeated here, yeah. but some of it will very much apply to like technical acting skills. Okay. Like that's where, you know, you're going to want to shore up because if you don't have a, a theater background or any experience acting, that's where I would start. Okay. Uh, right. You've been waiting for a while. Yes. What's the weirdest voice you two have had to do? That's your most memorable. I was a bystander yesterday. <laughs> and I, I was on the winning side of a bet. <laughs> and it was great. I don't love this voice. <laughs> I promise you, I don't love this voice. When we were doing the radio play panel yesterday, I pulled it out expecting Mike to tell me not to do it because I did it to him. And then he didn't. And then I had to stick with it for the whole thing. It was uh, in the playoff. Though. Well, it, just, uh, it, it was that whole joys of, well, she made me change my voice and she was doing this fun new voice. So I'm like, let's see how well you can maintain it. Well, I, <laughs> just to be evil. But, I stuck with it. Stuck with it. Well, you did very was, well, but was it was committed. entertaining for me. I was committed, <laughs> uh, and yeah. that's that's another thing you'll learn in acting, and like fundamentals. There's a level of commitment you have to give to that character, and hey, you done it, you're stuck with it. Yep. Gotta keep it up. You you win the role with that voice. That's what you're doing. So you better be ready and able and willing to do it. Uh, for you, I vote your Nelf voice just because I I just. Part of my heart shrivels every time you do it. And it's perfect because that's what you intended. Oh yeah, it, it's the whole joys of, you know, when, uh, you know, with Nancy and such, that it gets such a reaction out of her, so it makes it entertaining for me, especially, you know, when the eye twitches like right now. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, Nancy, you so much stop! fun to do this voice no, for you. No, no, stop, stop, stop. Why would I ever stop me, dear Nancy? Don't you love the sound of this voice and how much it just nope. makes you react no. to it? Nope. No. Nope. How it drives you away. Hands over, everybody's <laughs> <laughs> Jokes, Jokes aside, though, there's a place for really annoying character -y type voices. It's not always going to win you an audition. But if for some reason they are specifically looking for the most annoying voice you can pull out, just do it. At very worst, they're going to tell you it's a little too bad. Well, you, you can always rein it in, kind of. Yeah, you can always go too far and you can rein it in. But if we're having trouble getting you up to where you need to be, that's where we need to you know, work on some of those skills. So. Thank you for that, I think. <laughs> yeah, Good, you que indeed. Good question. Thank you. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, not really a question, but um, I first got into voice acting through like a youth group kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually two different groups, and they had like a combined summer camp. Um, Antics and Aspen. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're like basically for. Um, youth ages, I think, like, 13 to 21, mm -hmm. and uh, they do, like, all their camps are free, and they do, like, after-school programs and summer camps to get you into, like, acting, dance, and we were doing a podcast, 
but and it's all about like talking about troubles in the world, like basically whatever you want to talk about that you have like an opinion about, like um, not really politics, but more like um, racism or environmentalism. And mm. yeah, I just wanted to share that in case there are like other young people in here like me. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. That's really valuable. Thank you. More questions, oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that you're mentoring someone. Now, how do you decide who you want to mentor? And if so, where would someone maybe go to seek a mentor? That's really hard to answer, the second one anyway. Um, how do I decide that I, I should take on um, someone to mentor? For me, it's if I know I can provide something for them. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, if you come to me and you know you're working on a specific accent that I do know, or a specific like a trouble that you're having, um, and I think I can help you with it, absolutely, I'll take you on. Uh, at some point, though, I expect you to fully graduate out of me and like have a different teacher to go to. It, we're always gonna be friends, but I'm not always going to be your teacher because I will eventually run out of things to teach you. Uh, that's, that's kind of my view on it. Um, if you're looking for mentors, that's a really interesting question because you have to be very choosy about who's teaching you. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna like fork over a ton of money and then just be like, I learned nothing from you. Who are you, you fraud? You're not teaching me anything. Yeah, you need to research the people that you want to teach you because it should be someone who's actively working who has experience who knows what they're doing isn't just going to be like i'm going to show up at your house with a computer and charge you 500 dollars and just record a bunch of random stuff and tell you you did great mm -hmm. the idea is that you need to know who they are and the other thing you definitely want to know is what do they specialize in time to think because voice acting has many different aspects as we talked about and not, not many people are a master of every single Everything. one. No one is really truly a master of all things. Yeah, like some teachers might be like, yeah, they're animation teachers. They'll teach you everything about dubbing, animation, character work, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that's great. But your next teacher, you should probably find someone that does a different aspect of the business. And the idea is that the more well-rounded education you get, the better. Like, I had five teachers. Uh, of all of other local voice actors here kind of thing mm -hmm. and they all taught me different things and different aspects of the business kind of thing and in acting in general and it's I would recommend seeking out don't have to do it all once but seek out many different people in many different ways that they will teach you because of course everyone's got their own style their own beliefs personally for me um, I want to, if I'm going to mentor or show someone, I want to see that passion. I want to see that fire kind of thing because it's what I had. And it's not in a sense that you have to be like a master already at the beginning, but I want to know that you want this because if you want it, I want to help you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Uh, someone in the corner, you've been waiting a while. Yeah. Um, it can come, there's certain things that you can have natural limitations based upon your own voice and vocal range. It might just be a reality one must face. Um, that being said, part of it is playing and practicing. Um, I played a character in a D&D campaign who was a Russian character. And when I first started, couldn't do the damn accent for the life of me. But after practicing for a year, doing Sunday sessions for eight hours, yes, we played long time back in the day, regardless, I learned how to do the voice and how to practice and get the mannerisms and the emotional range. And it can just be playing and practicing. Um, I might not 100% answer what you're looking for, but... I think in a casual setting, it's important to recognize that you're not putting on a performance for a job. Right? You're not being paid to do this, you're doing this out of your own enjoyment. This is good practice. 
Uh, there are certainly ways that you can use, especially if you're doing like a D&D campaign or something, just to like really drive home a voice or at least to, to really identify a voice with a character. Uh, I have known DMs to make little printouts and then uh, double side them onto a popsicle stick and that's the character that they are currently voicing <laughs> because they are very educated. And they're they're having trouble with that specific voice. I, I cannot be a man per se, but I have this character stick. You see, there's this stick. It is there, and that I is just it, you know you're you're given you're given a lot of ways to play with it because you're you're there in your physical setting and you're able to use visual aids. It's quite fun because you know once you put up a character, it's not you anymore. And you're not just the person who is spewing a voice out, but you are this little phantasm that is on a stick and it is floating around and trying to insult players or something. And those of you that do play Dungeons and Dragons and those kind of role-playing games, whether you're DMing or you're playing, they are perfect for practicing voices. Yeah, you may drive the, uh, everybody else at the table bloody crazy, trust me, I know. <laughs> but it's totally worth it, especially like whether your session is two hours, four hours, eight hours, doesn't matter. The idea is that when you're in character, you do the voice because it will gain you so much practice and you'll have other people and yeah, maybe they don't do a character voice, but you still get to act and react in character and such because then you can create your own voices and characters because one thing we didn't touch on, which I'll just quickly talk about, impressions. Now we've all, a lot of us can do impressions, a lot of people, you've probably gone on the internet and seen a few, you know, YouTube videos of voice actors that do, you know, like, you know, oh yeah, I can do a hundred different character voices, and yeah, and sometimes, yeah, they're pretty bang on, and other times it's like, well, yeah, you got three, you know, the rest are like, okay, yeah, I'm sure you believe it, but sure. The idea is that impressions, they have their value, but they're not something that you can really make a living off of, because in a lot of cases with big productions, if they want, for example, say, someone to come in and be Homer Simpson. They're gonna hire the guy that is Homer Simpson. They're gonna go hire him. Um, but if you can work on your impressions, you can create original voices and original characters out of them and such. Unique voices are your bread and butter because if you can do a voice that nobody else can do, you hold, you hold more value than the person that just reiterates everybody else's. All right, you, you've been waiting for a while. Yeah. Uh, when you get a script and you see the character, do you ever look at the character and think, I voice this similar character, I might use that voice and maybe change something about it to then voice this new character that I've been given? Or do you just blank slate completely new? Let's think about it. Depends on the character. Depends I'm, on your director. That too. Under the boards. That's a good example. Yeah. Okay, well, I, one of the radio plays we did was Under the Boards, and the character that I was given was like a John Wayne Gacy type, you know, mass murderer and such. Uh, it was supposed to be a very dark script that eventually kind of leads to a zombie apocalypse. Um, but essentially my director let me play with it, and I turned a horror zombie epic into a rip-roaring farce kind of thing. <laughs> because... He trusted me, so I was like, okay, well, you know, it's just be ridiculously silly. And, you know, while we're talking about killing people and, you know, hiding bodies from the feds and stuff like that and <laughs> doing awkward little dance shuffles with my voice because, you know, the, the feds are here and they're going to arrest me. Oh, no, I have to talk my way out of it kind of idea. But, yeah, it, it can really depend. Um, if, if certain characters fit into certain archetypes and you have a voice that you want to try, go for it. Um, most of the time when you go into the studios and they, the first time that you go and do the audition voice, they don't give you direction on it because they want to hear what you came up with. Whether it's unique, something that fits an archetype, or something just completely brand new, because I've definitely done that in auditions where I've gone in and they're like, okay, Mike, we've heard these voices before, come up with something new, kind of thing. And it's like, okay, you got to do it on the spot. But that's, it can, it, it, your mileage may vary, kind of thing. It just depends upon what you feel comfortable with and what they're looking for. But you just need to be ready to adapt on the fly. Yep. 
Yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, in terms of like a, uh, when we were talking about impressions, like uh, a lot of my uh, coaches uh, like said to practice those, but they said that a bad impression could be a new voice for you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. 100%. That, that's about making unique voices and yeah. such and tweaking them so it's not like you are repeating character X kind of thing. Now, that character may have inspired you to come up with this voice, perfectly fine, great kind of thing. But as long as it's uniquely yours and not just a repeat of them, that's what holds the value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, probably could take about one or two more questions. Any? Uh, okay, so we've got one and two. Sure. And then, and then do you see one I missed? One over there. Okay, we'll get those. Who do you want to start? Uh, we haven't heard from you, so. Sure. As an adult now, out of school, yep. with no background in acting or voice acting. Sure. Where do I find classes? Okay, well, that easily sums up into the final speech, but um, okay. So, places that I can recommend. Obviously, community theater companies like Scorpio, Morpheus here in town, always looking for new talent, kind of thing. Um, Film, there is so many indie film productions all the time. Facebook, once again, so many of them looking on there or on Twitter. Um, when it comes to voice acting, uh, I will, of course, because he's a friend and a teacher of mine, I will recommend him, Brendan Hunter, of course. His website, www.brendanhunter.com. He also teaches on closing credits. That as well. Um, he does offer private lessons as well as group lessons kind of thing. Um, you would have to, like he's on closing call these days, like three to four times a week, kind of thing, yeah. teaching students all over the world. Yeah, I think he does, I think he literally runs like Monday to Thursday, different groups. Yeah, so. um, the, which also leads, of course, into what Nancy and I are starting up. Now, we are also getting into the teaching game ourselves. <gasps> I know. Yeah. Yes. I didn't give it away already. No. Okay, good, cool. You, you, get, you gotta be more direct, you know, less subtle. Less subtle, he's fun. No subtle for you. <laughs> anyway, um, we are developing a program at CJSW where we are going to be teaching in the discipline of radio dramas and such. Uh, we plan to be offering a three level course, uh, level one, which would be teaching everybody about voice acting, acting in general radio drama specific skills, the group dynamic, because in radio dramas, you generally are a group of people around one or two microphones, and you have to learn how to work together and feed off each other. Uh, level two uh, essentially will be scripts and character work, as well as we will assign people uh, characters in a script, which we will record and the studio will play at a later date. And then level three is the for those that are ready for the challenge, of course, is you'll be auditioning for roles and going through the whole audition process. And then when we get everybody cast and ready to go, we will be going live on the radio. So no screw-ups. Yeah. <laughs> and, hey. <laughs> but, and let me tell you, as having done a live radio and such, that adrenaline spike that you feel is glorious kind of thing. Bring your smartwatch. It's fun to watch. Yeah. Um, it, sorry? What would this be called? No, we haven't. Uh, we're just filling out the final paperwork with CJSW, but what we can recommend is for anyone who might be interested in taking these courses and or keeping in touch with us is we have business cards on the table. Do. So definitely please come up and grab cards. Even if you just want to talk and ask questions kind of thing, we're more than happy to answer and help. Cause why Always, you... always reach out because the very worst thing that could happen is that your email got lost. Yeah. And like I said, we do our best to get back to everyone because like I said, we were on the other side and we know what it's like and we want to help you all be the next generation. Yeah, good questions. Uh, okay. we got one, one more. One, if you got a quick one. Yep. Uh, any local acting groups you would recommend, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you would recommend to follow up, keep up with any current projects or find more work? 
Theatre Calgary is great, not only because they'll tell you about what's coming up soon, but also they will post when auditions for their shows are coming up. And they also occasionally post things like teachers who are open for these students. Um, Loose Moose Theatre, Lunchbox Theatre, um, Company of Rogues is a great uh, acting company in town. They teach more theatre, but it's still all relevant anyway. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely recommend any of those kind of thing. And you know, not that to subtly plug ourselves, but uh, you know, you can always come and learn from us. I'm looking up any about it. It's very convincing right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we do our best. <laughs> but uh, he does his best. <laughs> I show up and I forget that I'm running a panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody has to remind you. Mm. All right, very fast. Sorry, just quick pause. That kind of reminds me. I think there's also improv Calgary. So any guys who want to start creating your own character, figure out what you want to do. Check those guys out. Very cool. All right. Very fast. How do you avoid burnout in this industry? Sorry. How do you burnout. Avoid burnout? Oh, burnout. What a fun topic. Oh, jeez. Um, Seconds to go. Great. Okay, very quickly. Burnout is real and it is very bad. And please take care of your mental health because if you're taking yourself behind a microphone for performance and you are burnt out, you will not bring your full potential to the performance. And that's okay. The joke. Please take care of your mental health. The joys of voice acting, too, is that if you want to take a break and stop, you, you can. perfectly can. You don't, it's one of those things that, yeah, if you get yourself deep into four or five projects at once and then you need to take a week, a month, hell, a year off, doesn't matter. The idea is that because it's freelance, you get to set your own schedule. So if you feel that you are suffering, stop. Simple as that. Exactly. Otherwise, thank you all for coming. It is greatly appreciated. We hope that you all learned a lot, and like I said, please help please yourself up to the cards card. at the front. I look forward to hearing from everyone. Yep.